welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and today we have a great show lineup for you. We both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and um, Billy what do we have going on today? Oh well Renee once again, we are bringing some really high quality um, educational programming today. We've got three great segments and um, we've got all from our team. And um, we're gonna start off with um, Dr. Matt Springer. Matt's continuing his food plot series. So we got the second part of that one coming up. And then we're gonna follow that up with um, Dr. Jacob Muller and Dr. Ellen Crocker, both on our team, have been working on this series on invasive plants. And they're gonna feature one that is pretty prominent, certainly in the bluegrass region, but you you might find it elsewhere. Um, so they're going to be talking about what it is and how you can control it. And I'll just wait until we um, debut that invasive plant. And then as always, we have um, Laurie Thomas. She's also on our team, an extension forester on our team, and she's got the tree of the week. Um, this is a pretty unique tree that she's going to be talking about today. So again, we're so thankful to have you all with us, whether you're joining via Zoom or via Facebook Live. We are delighted to have you with us at From the Woods today. Right. Remember, anytime you have a comment, go ahead and type them in the chat pod and we will take questions after each presentation and so that you won't have any trouble getting your uh, questions answered. If you're on Facebook, you can type them in. If we can't answer them during the show, we'll be happy to answer after the fact. So uh, without further ado, I guess, uh, Matt, if you don't mind bringing your um, video on for us. Hey, there he is. All right, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to be showing today? Sure. So this is the next segment in the food plot series, and we're going to try to cover a little bit about um, the response of our demonstration area to what we did last time, uh, how we're going to accommodate our results from our soil tests, and then picking some seeds, and then how do you get those seeds in the ground to hopefully watch some things grow. So uh, we're going to have a, quite a few things going on today. Last segment, we talked a lot about the selection of the area for a food plot and then also how do you then get rid of the existing vegetation and we're going to look at our demonstration plot that we have here and you can see that um, what we did in preparation for what we're, our next steps here is has worked quite well we have a giant brown spot uh, where we sprayed the glyphosate on the grass and have ex uh, succeeded in killing the existing vegetation so the next step comes in of what do we do right so we killed the vegetation, now we gotta get something growing in that plot. So we have to select a seed uh, for what we want to plant in this food plot. And I just stopped by a local retailer, took a picture of what they had for options, and as you can see, there is a lot. And this isn't even at an ag store, this is just a general merchandise store. So we need to cover a little bit about what's out there, what you should think about in selecting a seed, and what are the things, when you pick a seed, what are the options? The first thing to consider is there are two major growing seasons, warm versus cold. Warm being something like corn, cold being something like winter wheat. Remember there's no advantage for one or the other, it's just when they grow and when they're more available for wildlife to consume. After that, based on your situations, you may decide to go with something like a throw and go that's easy to plant that you don't have to do as much work for bed preparation, or you can go with a single species of seed for your plot. Or the last option being that you go with a mixture of seeds for the plot. The advantage of the mixture is you're putting a lot of options on their dinner plate per se, right? You have a buffet there instead of just a single species there to, to, that is you know, nutritionally better off at one point in time. Now, there's both cool and warm season options you'll see here in a second. Now, this is a cool season option with a, a bunch of different things going on. Here's a warm season option that has soybeans, cowpeas, sorghum, and buckwheat. There's a couple things to look at when you look at a, a tag and the things that you need to pay attention to. Firstly, you always want to know what is in the actual bag and by what percentage. That way you have an idea of what you're putting in the ground. Next, you plant seeds at a pound per acre rate and that's suggested to you. So you, the thing that you need to know is how many live seeds you're actually putting in the ground and that's referred to as the germination rate. So if you have a low germination rate, below 90 rate, you know, percent or so, you may need to add more pounds of seed to get a successful uh, stand in that location. Lastly, you want to look at what you're going to plant and make sure you do some research on how deep that needs to be in the ground and also pay attention to other things on the packages, recommendations by the manufacturer of what you need to pay attention to while you're trying to get these established. 
that brings of actual preparing the bed and then finally planting them. And there's many tools that you need and can use to plant a bed. Uh, first and foremost, you're looking at some way of moving dirt around, whether that be a full on disc from a tractor or the setup we have, which is a much smaller disc and cultivator combo. You can get away with anything uh, that can move dirt, even a rake, but generally a disc is a common item. Now, if we look back at our plot, you can see we have a big brown spot with dead vegetation. Now, if we went through there and threw seed out, we may get some things to grow, but in order to maximize seed growth and success, we, what we want to do is use that disc, and that call to packer, and increase the amount of soil that's, that's broken up so that the seed roots can really get down there, get to nutrients, and also, uh, first and foremost, make sure that we have the most seed to soil contact as possible so that there's a lot of dirt there that will accept the seed when it gets spread out and it'll contact the soil, get wet, and that, that will initiate the growth of, the, of those seeds. And all we're really doing here is we're taking our time, we're using our disc, we're driving around the plot, and you know this may take a while to actually break it up well enough to get that bed in good shape, but we're just taking our time and moving dirt. Use the tool that we have and, and actually break that ground up and, and loosen that dirt up. And you know, you'll know you notice when it's, it's, it's set because when you pick the dirt up, it'll kind of crumble in your hand. Now, remember that soil test we took last time? This is when we're going to actually make those adjustments needed. Now, you should have gotten results back from your ag agent, and they'll make a recommendation to you on what you should do to that soil based on what you tell them you think you're going to plant. So knowing what seeds you want to plant is going to help uh, them make a recommendation to how to make that soil meet those needs. Now in terms of tools that you need to get that out into the ground, there's a couple options. There's a simple spreader that you can either push or pull um, that is for smaller scales. Now you can get into the larger industrial size or even have someone come out and, and actually lay ag line down if you need to. Uh, however, a small one should suffice. And really all you're doing is you're taking what's recommended, putting it inside of the spreader. It can be combined and you're going to want to try to play around with a little bit of, the, of how quick that comes out of the spreader and uh, do a pass with a little amount of, of, of material in it, paying attention to how it's spreading it out across the field, whether you're getting good distribution uh, or if you need to start playing with how quick it's coming out to make sure you're getting good coverage through the entire plot. Now have a conversation with your ag agent about your amendment here. You may have things that you add on to your soil that really um, need to be worked into the soil a little bit. So that would call for you to, once you finish adding uh, the fertilizer, to actually put that disc back on there and, and maybe make a couple passes through again to really work that into the ground to increase its effectiveness. Now that our soil is primed, now we need to start thinking about actually planting our seed. And there's a couple tools to use, including uh, something like a hand crank or even just tossing seed out in the field itself. Uh, or you can go more industrial like using a no-till drill. But the big thing here is that you are walking that seed, spreading it, and getting good coverage throughout the entire plot. And you need to do that in a way that's comfortable that you feel you're successful. Now for larger seeds, you can actually use that tool that we have there for the spreader for the soil amendment and place that in there and, and get a good coverage throughout. We're actually spreading winter wheat using that tool and it is spraying it at a, a high enough rate that we'll have a successful plot. Now that all the seed is spread, we need to think about how do we increase that seed to soil contact. And that's where the cultipacker comes in. And what this basically does is it's pushing down on the soil uh, and whatever's sitting on top of the soil to increase that soil to seed contact. And it primes that bed, it makes it look nice and even, spreads it out. Um, it's gonna spread out the fertilizer a little bit too. And you can see here's a couple pictures of seed and fertilizer all sitting next to each other. Um, and hopefully, you know, after that's all said and done, you're sitting there, fingers crossed, for some rain. Now that's the end of this segment. Next uh, segment will include how to maintain the plot and gauging success. And what happens when something goes wrong? Can you do something to fix it uh, to hopefully still have a successful plot? Thank you, Matt. We greatly appreciate you uh, doing that video for us. And I know that uh, there's a lot into doing a food plot and that kind of thing. So what are some of the things you should be thinking about? And I'm going to remind people to type questions in the chat pod uh, before you answer that in case there's more questions out there than that. Sure. So there's, uh, you know, there's some minute details you can get into. And unfortunately, the, the amount of time we have, I can't really get into a lot of them. Um, but there's um, things, you know, strategies that you can uh, implement. Um, for instance, you know, if it's a new plot in a new area, 
you may actually want to use a warm season uh, species at first, like corn or soybean, um, because they can be glyphosate resistant. And you can have them planted and you can actually go over them and spray the area with glyphosate to, to really knock back those weeds that are going to pop up once you release that seed bed and that seed bank, you're going to have a lot of stuff coming up. So if you have something that you can, you can um, plant that tolerates uh, herbicide control um, tools, then you want to do that first year or second year. Once you knock back that weed base, then you can start putting things into that uh, food plot that may be a little more sensitive to herbicides. Are there anything else you would like to tell our viewers? Um, remember, you know, that food plots should really be a small component of an overall wild, wildlife management plan for a property. Uh, the recommended rate for if you're thinking about an entire property or entire area is about 2% uh, should be made up of food plots. So that means 98% should be made up of other types of habitat. So make sure you put your focus accordingly. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, hey, Matt, I was going to thank you very much. It was a high quality production there. I appreciate it very much. I know it takes a lot of work to put those segments together, so thank you. All right, great. Well, moving on to our next segment, we uh, actually have um, Dr. Ellen Crocker on as well as um, Dr. Jacob Mueller. He, they're both online with us if they can pull up their videos. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Happy to be here this week. <laughs> yeah. Great. So do you want to hey, tell Jacob. us a little bit about what your next segment's going to be about? Yeah, so uh, Jacob and I are working on a series of videos and fact sheets about different invasive plants, how to recognize them, the problems that they're causing in your woods, and what to do about them. So today we picked one of the most common uh, plants that we see, at least here around the Lexington area in central Kentucky, um, probably familiar to many of you, and that is winter creeper. We're going to talk a little bit yep. about winter creepers, show you a video about that, um, and then answer any questions you might have. Winter creeper was introduced from Asia as an ornamental plant. Unfortunately, it rapidly escapes the garden and outcompetes native plants for light, space, nutrients, and water. Winter creeper can grow really differently depending on its environment. So it can carpet the ground, as you see here. It can grow as a vine up trees or it can grow kind of like a shrub, especially if it's growing over a downed tree or a fence. When it's growing as a ground covering, it will grow over and outcompete native plants, um, preventing regeneration of the trees that we want to be seeing in our woodlands. When it's growing as a vine, it can grow over small trees, prevent them from having access to light and decrease their health, eventually killing them. So winter creeper really easily adapts to its environment and the exact same plant can look really different depending on where and how it's growing. So if it's carpeting the forest floor, um, you're going to see it growing like this. Uh, it has leaves that are opposite, a shiny green color, these white veins running the length of the leaf. If it's growing up a tree as a vine, uh, those leaves might look a little different. Um, here you can see a vine that I pulled off of a tree, and it has a slightly different form. Uh, no matter what though, those leaves are going to be opposite from each other, oblong, shiny, dark green color on top, a lighter green underneath. The margins of the leaves of winter creeper are finely serrated, and in this one you can see it's been growing as a vine up a tree. Those leaves are quite large and broad. Um, when it's growing as a ground covering, those leaves are going to be smaller and darker. Uh, either way, those leaves are uh, kind of thick and have a waxy cuticle on the outside. Winter creeper only flowers when it's growing as a vine. It flowers in the summer in June or July, typically, and those will develop into fruits that will kind of burst open uh, into a fleshy, uh, orange, fleshy covered seed. And 
it's a popular ornamental plant where it can be contained uh, to some extent. Uh, it only produces berries and fruit when it's growing upward as a vine. So if it's not growing as a vine in those settings, it can locally take over, but it's unlikely to spread to new areas. Now, birds eat those berries, they will carry them far and wide. So even those plants in the landscape setting can have a big impact on what happens in your woodlands. Uh, how widely distributed the winter creeper is, how much cover there is, if it's a small area or whether it's a large area. And depending on those factors uh, will help you determine the best management strategy. Uh, if it's a small area, oftentimes we can pull individual plants uh, to pull up the entire plant, including the root system. If hand pulling isn't necessarily an option because it's so widespread, uh, cutting may be your best option to prevent winter creeper from spreading even further. Uh, it's important to cut the stem before it fruits, which typically occurs in late summer uh, and early fall. Oftentimes, uh, chemical application is, uh, is necessary uh, to prevent winter creeper from re-sprouting after you uh, cut off the stem. When we are dealing with large areas or small areas of something like winter creeper and we feel that herbicide application would be an important part of a management strategy, typically when we're thinking of herbicides it's not a one shot deal, it takes sustained effort and it's going to be part of an overall strategy. That's when we're going to get the best results. So we may be using mechanical removal as part of it to get it down to a reasonable level dealing with small patches. If we have an extensive you know, uh, um, infestation like we have here at the Arboretum, then yes, herbicide application would very well be an uh, important part of our strategy. The key for herbicide application is we want to get selective control. We don't want to wipe out everything. We don't want to damage our trees. We don't want to damage our understory. We just want to get the, herb, the, the, the winter creeper. We want to get it managed to a reasonable level. We may not be able to eradicate it, but we want to keep it managed so then we can then have it, it might be part of the landscape, but of course then it can coexist with the other organisms here that we're trying to promote. So there are a number of options with herbicides. Typically we would want to be using herbicides that do not have soil activity after application because then that would very well damage plants other than our winter creeper. So we'll be looking then typically then at foliar application, but we want to get selective control. We can apply something foliar at this time of year, but that would be a mistake because we would then wipe out everything. We don't want that. We have options and the best way to do this is by the timing of our application. Winter creeper is a major issue because it stays green year round. Our other organisms, like our trees and that, have periods of time when there are no leaves. So after leaf fall, we can be applying things to the winter creeper, that's the only thing that's green here, it's not going to injure our trees. So with that timing, we have windows where we can do this. We've done research where we've been applying you know, selective herbicides in the off season, in winter time. Things are, you know, everything's growing more slowly, Symptoms are going to take more longer to appear, but we get, in the end, we get good results and we get selectivity. We may need to reapply, but we have the selectivity. So then we can then do this without harming our other vegetation, which is a key. So thanks for joining us today and learning more about the invasive plant winter creeper. Good luck in your management. And if you want to learn more, visit our website and check out our fact sheets. and Jacob, that was a great video. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate that. And um, Ellen, I've actually heard people actually plant these in gardens. Should you do that? And what would be better if so, if not? 
That's a great question. Um, it is a really popular ornamental plant. Um, I think because it's evergreen and it just completely carpets things. Um, and it does that really well and it'll grow really well and it will take over everything. And any of you gardeners out there uh, probably know it all too well, but you can still find it for sale in a lot of places. So I really encourage everyone to not use that and to avoid other invasive vines in your landscaping as well. Things like um, English ivy or vinca that might seem like they're gonna be perfect and then get out of control and not only in your yard and garden, but in the woods too. Um, so I'd really recommend uh, picking some native alternatives to those. A few different options would be if you're looking for something that's gonna grow really densely and kind of carpet an area, I really love wild ginger and have had great success with it growing really densely, beautiful foliage. Um, and then if you want something that's gonna grow more like a vine, uh, covering things, our native trumpet honeysuckle is beautiful and has these amazing flowers that last a long time, uh, cross vine, Dutchman's um, pipe, uh, maybe native clematis and native wisteria. Again, avoid the invasive versions, um, but there are really lots of options. Okay. And um, Jacob, if people have a lot of this in their forests, can you tell us again where they should even start? Sure. Well, I think uh, that's kind of where it becomes uh, a bit more challenging to control uh, and uh, that's kind of the point where you should be really considering some sort of herbicide uh, application and it's it's really critical that uh, the timing of the application and, and as was described in the video it's it's important that you uh, apply the broadcast uh, foliar application of the herbicide uh, kind of in the winter seasons when the when the winter um, creeper is still green and all the other vegetation is um, died back for the for the season yeah, I, I could see a lot of people worried about hurting their trees. Um, so they want to make sure they're doing that at the right time. Yeah, no doubt. I was going to say that winter creeper, though, is going to keep trees from sprouting for sure. You saw how thick it gets. It can just completely, it'd be the only plant that's out there, it seems like sometimes. So, and if you like yeah. wildflowers or hunting for mushrooms and the winter creepers are in the, is in the way, you won't see any of those things. Um, but you definitely don't want to damage uh, those wildflowers that you want uh, while you're removing your winter creeper. Uh, so something to keep in mind and uh, uh, following those recommendations that Jacob mentioned. So we have a question that the, this person is fighting winter creeper coming in from neighbors' yards, and it's a major battle. What would you, I'd like to question you about Tree of Heaven and ID. Um, how do you kill those? Over the messages, and I see one um, about the vine climbing up a tree and uh, not able to be pulled back to prune. Um, you can uh, cut the vine at the base where it's growing, maybe even take a chunk of that vine out, um, and then treat the surface of that vine with an herbicide, you know, not cutting into the tree. And it can be really tricky to not cut into that tree because those vines really adhere to that bark. Um, they have all these aerial roots that kind of tap into it. But if you can carefully try to maybe pry that vine back a little bit with a pry bar and just cut the vine, treat that surface, surface with an herbicide, it'll kill the root system. And then you don't really have to worry as much about what's growing above that. That will die on its own. And it can be a little tricky, especially if you have a lot of small vines versus one big one. Um, but uh, that would be what I would recommend. I see that we have a comment from um, another comment about mixing with a surfactant. Um, so that's a great idea um, because when it comes to winter creeper, it's got this really waxy surface, this really waxy cuticle that can be difficult to penetrate. And there's some different ways around that. Um, you know, some people rough up the surface with either mowing or weed whacker before they apply that herbicide. Um, mixing with a surfactant is a great option as well to allow that um, to penetrate. I see there's a comment about Tree of Heaven. Well, yeah. we have another Tree of Heaven uh, uh, video and fact sheet hopefully coming your way sometime soon. We're working on a whole series of these and we'd love to get your feedback on what you liked, what you didn't, and what kind of information would be helpful to you. So if you've got ideas about what species we should cover in the future, what do you most need right now? Tree of Heaven is on the list. Um, and one thing I would say about this is, uh, how do you kill a tree of heaven? Um, you don't just cut it and uh, wait for it to re-sprout 10 times worse than it was originally. Um, you know, that's where you 
Killing the root system is going to be very key, um, either completely removing it, uh, which is sometimes really hard to do, or using herbicide uh, when you do your uh, um, removal or something like a basal bark treatment. Jacob, did you want to mention anything else on that? No, I don't think so. I think it just kind of drives home the point um, of really selective control and trying to only kill the target species because there's a lot of um, native and great uh, beneficial plants and trees out there and we want to really uh, take our time and kind of create a strategy to uh, manage these invasives. And so the more targeted we can get in controlling those, the better. Looks like we've got a question about, about crossbow. crossbow. Yeah. yeah, so crossbow is one of the herbicide formulations you can use. It's a mixture of 2,4-D and triclopyr. And that's uh, one that's frequently recommended for that fall application, you know, after everything else has lost its leaves, then uh, using that. But there are lots of different herbicides that could work. Um, so some, you know, have different chemical formulations. So if you hear of something like glyphosate, um, it's not probably going to be sold to you as glyphosate. It might come as Roundup. Um, similarly, triclopyr, you know, it might be under different brand names like Garlon. Um, so just kind of an encouragement to everyone when you're looking at your options, uh, it's something to research and look at for your area um, and always follow the instructions on the label. That's to keep you safe, it's to keep your wood safe, um, make sure you're wearing proper uh, protective equipment as well. I was going to say an important thing about those labels, they'll dictate because sometimes some of these herbicides are only um, designated for forest settings, sometimes they're for open fields, some are usable near water and others, so you won't really know that information unless you really review that label. So again, the label's the law, follow the label. And it can be confusing because something as simple as Roundup, there are a lot of different formulations of Roundup, some of which, uh, you know, can kill your trees and some of which won't, depending on how you apply them. Uh, same with Garlon. There are different uh, ways that that's formulated. So you really want to read that label closely and pay attention. So are there a lot of invasives that, um, I know some of them, if you cut them and do nothing, like you said earlier, it just makes them mad and they come back even worse. Are there a lot of them that way or are there just a few? Unfortunately, yes, a lot of them are that way. And you might be able to do something like, uh, let's say winter creeper, um, you know, it's only gonna make fruit and flower uh, when it's growing up a tree. So if you cut it, um, you might prevent that for some period of time, uh, but it's gonna happily regrow and make that vine again and grow right back up that tree. Uh, so you might delay some of that. And that's similar with a lot of other invasives. You know, you might push things back, um, but uh, many of them come back uh, even worse when you cut them. I, I've heard the saying that, uh, what is it, when they die, they bring lots of friends to their funeral. Uh, <laughs> so if you cut them, uh, you're going to get a lot more stems coming up where you used to have one. And that's one of the real frustrations with invasive plants. I think it's a general reminder to um, Jacob and Ellen that we want to get these things before they become a major invasion, right? Um, it's so much easier to control a little bit of winter creeper around the base of a tree than to cover your entire forest floor um, with winter creeper and trying to deal with that. So yeah, being alert, being out in your woods and paying attention to what's going on out there can save you a lot of time and headache down the road for sure. Looks like you all have answered all of the questions, so we greatly appreciate you both being yeah. on and giving us that video, and we look forward to the series that we're going to have within the coming months. Yeah, no doubt. I'm telling you, Renee, the UK Forestry and Natural Resources Extension team is really up in their video game. You all are doing we a are. great job, really. Well, that's all um, Jacob, so thank you, Jacob, for your great all right, video Jacob, expertise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, teamwork makes a dream work. A good job, guys, really. Appreciate it very much. So. All right. Um, well, again, I think Alan and Jacob are going to be able to stick around with us, um, as, and hopefully Matt's going to be around. So if you've got some other questions about that, come on and um, drop those in. But I think we've got one more segment we're going to try to cover today, Renee. The tree of the week. Yeah, so we've got Laurie Thomas with us. Laurie is an extension forester here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. Laurie, how are you today? Doing great, doing great. Glad to be here. So yes, we have a new, another addition to our tree of the week, and we kind of still sticking with the oak theme, thought it was appropriate with um, Dr. Springer's talking about food plots. This is a, a tree that is an attractive tree to wobble and very beneficial to it. Um, and it is um, one that is, uh, we find here in the inner bluegrass, it's one of our oaks that grow in a limestone or an alkaline soil um, and successfully. So here we go with the chinkapin oak. 
I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the chinkapin oak. Chinkapin oak, Quercus muhlenbergii, is a member of the white oak group. It is sometimes called yellow chestnut oak, rock oak, or yellow oak. Sometimes you might see the name spelled C-H-I-N-Q-U-A-P-I-N, which is also another acceptable spelling of chinkapin. It is a medium-sized tree that typically grows 40 to 60 feet tall with diameters between 24 and 36 inches. However, on exceptional sites, it can grow up to 90 to 120 feet tall, especially in the Ohio Valley. It is considered shade intolerant, even though young seedlings appear to start out as exhibiting some shade tolerance. The acorns are a favorite for a variety of wildlife. Chinkapin oak grows across portions of the eastern and midwestern United States from New England to northeast Mexico. It grows in alkaline soils on limestone outcrops and well-drained slopes. At a glance, it might be confused with chestnut oak, swamp white oak, swamp chestnut oak, and dwarf chinkapin oak. Chinkapin oak is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged chestnut-like leaves, as you can see in the photo here. The leaf form is simple, which means it's made up of one blade. And the leaves are usually between four to seven inches long, and they're typically oblong to obovate in shape. And they have coarsely serrated or toothed margins, and each tooth appears to be tipped with a small gland or callus. They are dark and sometimes shiny on the upper surface and much paler below, and sometimes the underside is somewhat hairy. The fall color ranges from yellow to orangish to brown. It really makes a handsome landscape tree. Chinkapin oak is monoecious, which means the tree is made up of both male and female flowers. The male flower is yellow-green, which is like a three to four inch long catkin. And the female flower is very small and it is in the current year's leaf axis. And they typically are green to reddish in color. The flowers emerge with the leaves and they are wind pollinated. The fruit of chinkapin is an acorn that's born either singly or in pairs. The acorn's usually about a half an inch to one inch long and it has a bowl shaped cap that covers about a third of the acorn. The acorn cap has tattered fringes around all the way around the margins. The acorns ripen to a dark brown between September and October. The acorns mature in one growing season, as with other white oaks, and they are dispersed by gravity, birds, and rodents, and germinate soon after falling. Even though animals are good dispersal agents, they also consume many of the sweet acorns. Acorn production usually begins around 20 years of age, with best production on trees greater than 20 inches in diameter. And good seed crops vary from, from year to year. A cold or wet weather during the flowering season in the spring can result in poor seed production. Chinkapin oak is an important wildlife tree. It is browsed by deer and rabbits and beaver who feed on the bark and the twigs. The sweet, high-quality acorns are a dependable food source for mice, squirrels, voles, and other mammals such as deer and black bear. The acorns are particularly important food for red-headed and red-bellied woodpeckers, northern bobwhites, and blue jays. And numerous other bird species consume the acorns, including rough grouse, wild turkey, crow, northern flicker, and the brown thrasher. The National Wildlife Federation consider oak as one of the top 10 trees for wildlife because they help wildlife grow. Oaks serve as a host tree for more than 500 different Lepidopteran larvae, including dagger moss and the giant silk moth. These larvae, in turn, feed the seasonal migratory songbirds, such as our warblers. These large trees also provide critical nesting habitat for many of our cavity nesters, including the white-breasted nuthatch. The oaks provide good cover for a variety of mammals as well because the leaves typically persist longer than other plant associates. The bark of the chinkapin oak is relatively thin, light gray, rough, and flaky. The wood of chinkapin oak is hard, heavy, strong, and durable. The sapwood is pale, and the heartwood is a dark brown. Chinkapin oak falls into the white oak group and shares many of the same traits as white oak, Quercus alba. Chinkapin oak is used for saw timber where it grows in abundance. It's also used for cabinetry, furniture, pallets, and railroad ties. It also makes excellent firewood. 
The national champion Chinkapin Oak is in Rockingham, Virginia. It's 287 inches in circumference, 66 feet tall with a 113 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion Chinkapin Oak was at one time the national champion. It was located in Harrison County at Griffith Woods Wildlife Management Area. It was 309 inches in circumference, 69 feet tall with a 70 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about Chinkapin Oak. The acorns are edible and sweet when they're roasted, and they were an important food source for Native Americans. Chinkapin Oak is noted historically for its role in fueling steamships along the Ohio River. The durable wood made excellent fences, and when those farms fell by the wayside, the wooden fences were collected and placed on the riverbank to sell to the passing engineers of the steamships. Chinkapin Oak's scientific species name Muhlenbergii honors the Pennsylvania minister and botanist Gottlieb Muhlenberg. Thank you for joining me today to learn about the Chinkapin Oak, and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy this outstanding oak. Thank you so much for that wonderful video. We always look forward to every tree of the week. Uh, we always uh, wonder what the tree is going to be and uh, really appreciate you doing those. Um, I know some people may be curious uh, as they're typing questions in the chat pod if you want to know anything is if they actually wanted to purchase one to plant in their backyard, um, where should they go? Um, well, uh, our Kentucky, and I've actually put the link in the chat pod, um, our Kentucky Division of Forestry, we have two nurseries here in the state that they run and they do sell chinkapin seedlings. They have a whole list of trees that they sell and the order, the seedling order form should be out soon. And you'll want to start thinking about and planning what you want to order now and go ahead and place that order and then your seedlings will be delivered to you in the spring. I mean, you usually pick February or March or sometime to have those delivered. But chinkapin is one of the oaks that they, they sell there. So yeah, check it out, the, the, the seedling nursery. They got fact sheets on all the trees they sell there too. Great. An amazing resource for folks here in Kentucky, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I believe, and we've got a show coming up in the next couple of weeks where we'll talk about um, the Kentucky Division of Forestry's um, tree seedling nurseries. So that'll be a great one. Definitely. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Yay. So. You did such a good job, Laura. Really. <laughs> Covered everything. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate that effort every week. I know it takes you some time to put those together, but we appreciate it. Um, yeah, and you're building up a big library of them too on our YouTube page as well. So, you know, folks, you can uh, visit our, our main webpage, ukforestry.org, and down at the bottom, there's some links to our YouTube page um, as well as our Facebook page that you can check out um, directly many of those videos. So, Laura, thanks again. Appreciate it. Yeah, we segment all of our videos. You can see all of the whole segment on From the Woods Today, but we also do all the little segments, like if there's a, a series or a Tree of the Week, you could watch every single one of the Tree of the Weeks if you wanted to on our YouTube channel. Again, like Billy said, if you just go down to the bottom of uh, our list or our page on ukforestry.org, um, at the very bottom, there's a link that says YouTube Forestry Extension, and you just click on that. Um, we put it in the chat pod, so that's a great link just straight to the YouTube page. So yeah. thank you, Brianna, for doing that. But uh, if you have any questions about that, you can just email us at forestry.extension at uky.edu, and we'll definitely get those answered. But uh, again, Billy, we've done it again. And so another show wrapped up. I know. So. Hey, what, one quick thing, though. I want to ask our sure. viewers a, a quick favor. Please help us spread the word about this show from the woods today. Um, you probably know some folks out there that would be interested in this. Even if they can't join us live, they can check out the recordings of the show. Um, we want to spread this as much as we can. And also a quick little plug. Our Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course started last night. Um, it's still not too late to register. So if you're interested in joining the Woodland Owner short course this year. Um, we've got the next sessions will start on Thursday night, um, but you have to register to participate. Um, so please join us on that series. And um, we've got a lot of great presenters and speakers talking about all things forestry and wildlife here in Kentucky. 
definitely. And remember, you can always go to From the Woods today to give us any comments about the show or uh, suggestions. We'd love suggestions. You know, we're always trying to come up with new ideas for you all. So if there's something that you really want, let me know. And um, that would be great. And you can even send pictures in. I know uh, Matt's done a couple of snake IDs just from pictures that have been sent. So um, you never know when we'll use your stuff. So we greatly appreciate it. Again, go to fromthewoodstoday.com to get all that information. Sounds good. Folks, thank you all so much. Um, we appreciate y'all um, choosing to spend some time with us and we hope you get a lot out of this show. And as Renee said, let us know how we're doing. Visit us at fromthewoodstoday.com and um, give us some feedback. Take care.